hope that your Tuesday is going well. I thought it was Monday for a little while today, but I've now readjusted myself and recognized that it's Tuesday. So that is a good, that is a good thing. Um, well, ha good afternoon, everyone. It's great to have you here at our uh, virtual conversation series. Um, I'm excited to spend some time with you all this afternoon. My name is Kristen Young and I use she, her pronouns. I serve as the executive director here at Leadership and uh, will be kind of helping guide some of our conversation today. Uh, would love to have you all start to introduce yourselves in the chat. Just tell us where, where you're joining us from and your name and that would, that would be great. Kind of get to know each other and get started. Um, as we get started, uh, I have a couple of slides. At, we're all so familiar with Zoom, but I feel like we need to put this up there just as a reminder of how we'll use our space today. We will uh, be using the, the comment, the chat feature. So please go ahead and post your comments or questions there in the chat. Uh, Brent and I will watch those as we go through our time together to really bring in your thoughts and comments and voices. And uh, we may ask you as we go through the time together, depending on how many people we have to unmute, if you want to come in and share and talk, you're welcome to do that. Um, but we want to make sure we get through our content and uh, engage in conversation with you all this after this afternoon. As we think about where we are um, and entering into the space this afternoon, uh, we have up here just a, a land acknowledgement for you all and um, invite you to think about where you are joining from. I'm joining from Champaign, Illinois, which is the native and indigenous homes of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi tribes, amongst others as well. Um, and I'll let, um, and I always think about that and think about the the land that we're on, right? And, and what that means for us in the history that is there. And um, Brent, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining from. Yeah, thanks, Kristen. Hi, everyone. My name is Brent Turner. I use he and him pronouns. Um, I'm also joining from the Chicago region. I see some folks in chat joining from that region. Um, and this is a slide that shows from Northwestern University where I'm currently seating, uh, that we sit on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and the Odawa. Um, and Northwestern University, Evanston, and Chicagoland uh, is a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other Native tribes, um, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. Um, I think when we, uh, you know, think about land acknowledgments and attributing um, the spirit of why we think of land acknowledgments, it's not just the past. It is absolutely decolonizing and thinking today, right now how um, systems of oppression still continue to operate. And so I invite you to sit for a moment and reflect on not only the land that you are sitting on or joining from, but your role in deconstructing um, what has been and what continues to be. Thank you, Brent. So a little bit about Leadership, if, if, if you're joining us and Leadership is new to you, uh, Leadership is a not-for-profit organization and our, our mission is to transform the world by increasing the number of people who lead with integrity and a healthy, have a healthy disregard for the impossible. And we do this work because we have a vision of creating a more just, caring, and thriving world. Um, and we don't live in that world, right? We live in a world where there is so much unrest and injustice and people are not thriving. Um, and I don't need to turn on any social media to be to see that on a daily basis. And so our work here is to do that, is to provide skills and space for conversation for healing, uh, conversation for learning and not and dialogue uh, to help create that, that world that we all want to live in. Uh, and we do that with this definition as our grounding piece. Uh, there are hundreds and thousands of leadership definitions, but this happens to be the one that we have created and crafted over time. And um, we really think that leadership does involve living in a state of possibility, making a commitment to a vision, developing relationships to move that vision into action, and sustaining a high level of integrity. We think effective leadership takes place in the context of a community and results in a more equitable society. Um, and I think you'll see that as we have this conversation here this afternoon, there are bits and pieces of this leadership definition uh, that I know ring true for myself and for Brett in the work that, that we both do um, in higher education. And so I'm excited to engage in that uh, conversation a little bit more. So with that, I uh, will let Brent introduce himself uh, as we get started. Welcome, Brent. I'm so excited to, to be with you this afternoon. Me too. Thank you again. I wish we could be in person together, having coffee around tables together. Um, as Kristen said from the top, I do invite folks to populate the chat, use the raised hand feature. You know, this is meant to be a dialogue. Uh, and I'm just going to present some concepts with you all. 
Um, by no means have I arrived, but I'm just presenting some things to explore our persistence. Uh, but I certainly invite you to contribute as well. Uh, there's wisdom in the room that I would like to unlock. Um, so again, I'm Brent Turner. I use he and him pronouns. I currently serve at Northwestern University uh, as the executive director of Campus Life. Um, and I've been in the field of student affairs for a couple of decades. Um, and I also serve as a leadership co-lead for the Institute and Catalyst and other programs. So I'm familiar with uh, these sessions, this group, and I'm just delighted that you all have joined me today. Um, I do want to start us off with a quick poll. So uh, as you're able in the, yep, there, thanks, Chris, and it pops right up. I reflect on my sense of purpose. Um, this is a single choice. You can answer never, monthly, weekly, daily, or other. In general, I reflect on my sense of purpose. And this just helps get a pulse of who's in the room. Um, and as we engage in conversation about exploring our persistence, we'll define this a bit in a, in a bit. Okay, it looks like we have everybody has responded. Here you go. Wow, cool. All right, thank you all for engaging in that. Um, just take a, a moment to notice we have folks that never reflect on purpose. Thank you for being courageous to say the unsaid. Some folks are like, yeah, I do that monthly or weekly, some even daily. I would love for folks to continue to populate and chat. How do you do that? Um, so that we can share from one another, right? Some proven or best practice. What does it look like if you're reflecting daily on your purpose? Um, and if there's an other way to do that, I know that we're not capturing all of the ways you do that in that poll. Um, thank you, Chris, and you can advance to the next slide. So we're going to talk about persistence today. And where I invite folks in is um, we're going to explore persistence versus retention. So I want to share a quick definition. Um, a little bit of my background is my dissertation research was on student affairs persistence. Um, so those of you joining from higher education, you might um, that might ring true for you. But in essence, why are we choosing to stay in this profession called higher education or student affairs? Uh, could be unlike other professions, and it could be very similar to why folks stay in their career. And we'll go a little bit general um, today, but when we think about persistence, I want us to kind of use the similar language that persistence is actually an individual level phenomenon, such as like persisting to a goal, right? Students, we ask that you persist to commencement. It is not the institutional level goal of retaining folks. Persistence is a, I want to do this, not that there's external factors hoping that I do this, right? We talk a lot about student retention and those are, or maybe employee retention. There are activities and strategies that we use to institutionally retain folks. What we're talking about today is all you. It is your own persistence of your individual level goal of why do I choose to do that, not the systems level. So I wanna kind of flip the script. Um, so that's a, a quick definition of persistence versus retention. Kristen, if you wanna share the image we have coming up next. Some folks, you might have seen this, and I borrowed this from a colleague who brings it up quite often. This is a nice chance, we'll send the slides after, but a nice chance to maybe screenshot, take a photo, draw this as you're able. But there is a conversation about purpose. Uh, there's a pretty loud conversation right now on Twitter about student affairs and why we stay, and are we exploiting our purpose? Um, Many times we tell folks to join this profession because it's really meaningful. And we sometimes forget to talk about the hours or the pay or the overall job dissatisfaction, uh, the burnout, the grit. So when I was exploring dissertation topics, I had seen a lot of those research, right? That people are leaving the profession in the first five years. And there was a lot of negative energy. And I flipped it to think, well, what's the opposite of leaving? Why are people then choosing to stay? So what are some thoughts from folks as you make sense of this image, right? We have, we'll hear buzzwords, vocation and mission and calling my passion, but purpose actually is here at the center of all of these circles that are actually all in relationship. You might love it. You might be great at it. You might just be paid for work, right? It's called work for a reason. I hope that some of us feel like, wow, the world needs it and needs me, but you're not the only one. You're not the martyr that if not you, then who? There are others to do crucial work. But at this intersection is my sense of purpose. And that's why we start with reflecting today on, do I even think about my sense of purpose at the intersections? So I welcome folks to unmute or drop in chat, just some observations about this as you're probably sitting at work today, 
right? You're sitting either at home or in person somewhere in any vocation. Kristen, what jumps out to you when you see this? Yeah, I think when I look at this, I see that the purpose is at the core and it's so small, right? And so I knew, and I often think that sometimes when I think about my purpose working with students or working with high, in higher education is that it, it overlays all of that. Like I've seen it as something much larger, but in times of stress or struggle, I, that purpose really shrinks back down because mm -hmm. of the outside pressures, right? That sometimes it's easy for me to forget that purpose or for it to get silenced because of the outside pressures that I'm facing in the day-to-day grind that is that is coming at me yeah i thank you for sharing vulnerably um we often talk about how students persist right to achieve a goal we hope that you persist to graduation um rarely are we engaging in conversations like this though right. Right. Uh, persistence often for students are steps towards something and not actually this deep reflection could be for some of you you said you do this daily right so I hope that this might start the conversation. We'll look at this image again at the end of the session, but I think this is kind of planting the seed um, for folks as we think about vocation, calling, and purpose. So here's here's our homework then, friends. Yeah. I was gonna say, in the, Kelly mentions here that she likes that there are spaces that are purpose adjacent that feel meaningful, even if they're not hitting it exactly. And it's okay for seasons of life, right? I think that's, I, I really resonate with that piece, Kelly, too, of like, there are seasons where that's going to be okay. I, I think I get worried when that season becomes too long or it becomes mm. just a standard operating protocol. Yeah, thank you for that. Purpose adjacent. I love that language. Still on the page, though, right? Still at least on the radar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, and what we've, so I will also give a preface. When I did my dissertation research, I was telling Kristen at the front, I studied people in 2018 and 19. We didn't have yet a global pandemic um, on the radar. And so it, it was, it's interesting to think now, why do we stay when we've seen what folks have said, the great resignation or the great reevaluation, sitting with self, do I get rid of what I think I know and explore a new opportunity, right? Do I throw things away when I'm entrenched in my career? Um, or is there so much collective trauma that I just cannot even, right? And yesterday's session on compassion fatigue, I thought brilliantly set us up today on when we're tired, why do we choose to still do it, right? And at 41 years old, I don't know if I would stop, go back and do finance as a career. That's a lot of like unlearning and relearning. And so then you have this entrenchment moment of like, well, I, I can't not do this. And I'm still called because I love it. And I think the world still needs it. I hope I'm good at it. I like that I'm sometimes paid for it. But all of this kind of purpose adjacent language might help you reflect on like, do I stay or do I go? And people are mentioning here in the chat, Brent and Gladys mentioned it first of that rec she recognized that the sense of purpose beyond or beyond their work, right? So thinking about how sometimes that, and I, I think too, and there's a couple other comments, but I think um, Emily mentioned too that she finds a lot of purpose in my work, but there's outside of that work too that you can find your your purpose. And sometimes that's more life giving. I think sometimes if the day to day of work drains me, I, I don't know if other people relate to that, but where I can be adjacent. I think for myself, I think of a mentoring relationship that I've been in for a, a long time with a, a woman who's now graduated high school. Like that for me was purpose was purposeful, and is is there's the same purpose that I have in my daily work but would give me life in a different way than, than my, than my day to day. Yeah. I, when I say I've seen some conversations on Twitter and Facebook and others, um, there is a large conversation going on that I hope folks engage in that maybe your sense of purpose is not related to your job. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, some folks are finding purpose in the side hustle, or I want to get paid for my passion and my love. Don't exploit that. My passion has to be my work. And there's just an interesting concept. Gladys, I welcome you in. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Well, morning for me. I'm in California. It's 10 a.m. over here. Um, but yes, I just wanted to add on to that. So during the pandemic, it was really eye-opening because for a long time as a young professional, I thought if I'm driven and I'm passionate, I'm going to do well. And then during the pandemic, I just, I don't know what happened. And mm. so then it like had me reflecting on like my job and my work. And I came to the conclusion that what I'm good at doesn't necessarily need to be like my passions. Like I can be good at my job 
and be passionate about photography or social media, whatever, right? And so it doesn't necessarily mean I can still be good at my job and doesn't necessarily correlate with the things that I find passion and purpose in, um, because those are two different things. And for the longest time, I thought uh, my purpose is this, my passion is this, but I was good at my job and my purpose is something else. Um, and I can, you know, and so I'm beyond that work um, and then setting those boundaries and that added to other things, because as you mentioned, um, I'm a professional in higher education. And so sometimes it's very like, you need to do that. You need to do that. So I've definitely learned to set those boundaries and like, you know, there's only so much we can do or one person and um, taking it day at a time. Yes. Thank you, Gladys, for sharing. And, you know, as a leadership educator and a, a college student professional, right, we're hoping that students are having those conversations. We invite them to think about their sense of purpose, right? And we hope that they're thinking about themselves as a whole person beyond maybe a major or how they might contribute to societies in after graduation. Um, but sometimes we do that on like brainstorm island. Like let's go talk about our purpose and who we are becoming maybe outside of a student organization meeting or a classroom setting. And it's like their major, their vocation might also may not be connected to their purpose, right? And we're creating conditions or co-creating conditions with students all the time to think about a, a world they wanna live in, right? And here we are, like, am I modeling that for my students, though? Am I being vulnerable in that conversation? Do I have my own passion and side hustle? Like, how are they learning and watching what I do? Or am I all talk trying to create these conditions, but I'm not living it for my own authentic self? Thank you for sharing that, Gladys. And I think that does prompt us, Kristen, for our next slide. Because these are com virtual conversations for leadership educators, and often we talk about students, and it's sometimes a scapegoat, right? And the, I'm inviting us in to look in the mirror. The hold on, am I okay with the hours I work and the pay I get, or the trauma I've experienced? Um, why do I choose to stay, right? In any role or vocation, and am I offering lip service from the front of the room with students, but not actually living it out? And that's not bad. It's a moment to notice. And it's an invitation to look at the purpose adjacent reflection on, yeah, I'm swirling, but I don't know who to talk to about it or how to reimagine what my purpose or passion or work could look like. They may not intersect and that's okay. Polling question number two. Thanks, Hold on one moment, I'm getting no, you're good. I have the <laughs> utmost respect for the back of house operations on these things. There we go. So in context, and by pandemic, the context is from COVID-19, not to not name the racial pandemics we've experienced. But since the timeline of pandemics, I have left or changed my jobs or careers. I'm curious about changing or other. has participated. Interesting. I chose other because I stayed in the current role or career that I was in. I invite folks to make sense of this or share if they are willing in chat or if you're welcome, you're welcome to unmute or raise hand. Since the pandemic, some of you have left and changed. I'm curious what brought you there, why you chose to, to take the courageous leap. If folks are curious about it, is there a cry for help? What are you curious about? Um, and if you've responded other, I welcome more context from folks that wanna share. I can, I can share first. Um, I chose other because I fell into both categories. Um, so during the pandemic, um, you know, in higher ed, my contract ended and so they couldn't renew it. And so I know that was a situation for a lot of folks. And so I, for the longest time, was um, a professional in nonprofit and after school programming. So I went back to nonprofit after school programming. And then during that same pandemic, I came back into higher ed. It was crazy um, interviewing via Zoom. And so within that transition of switching out and coming back in, it also had me reflecting, well, what if I were to do something else like completely different and having myself explore, again, like my passions and what I'm good at. And then like um, having it be transferable in a different um, profession, in a different area that isn't necessarily where I'm at. 
Um, so I kind of call them both. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. I'll just, I'll, oh, sorry about that. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <clears throat> I, uh, I'll share. I put the uh, am curious about changing jobs and careers. And as I'm curious about it, you know, people give me um, what's the word? They give me reasons to stay in higher ed. Uh, and so it's like, I'm looking at this, or you get a call about something, and then someone comes and tell you like, hey, you're the reason I graduated. And I'm just like, um, so do you leave the work? Um, but I think the reasoning for me, um, look, I had to look who was on here, if anybody from my institution, uh, I think the reasoning for me is it's been dwindling resources. Um, and I think we're seeing that across the spectrum. And so those resources are dwindling. The staff who are still here are doing more, um, and then some of those things aren't necessarily seen or, um, from our perspective, appreciated. Uh, and so it just kind of gives you this kind of frustration piece. And so it's like that we're in small groups at the water cooler, you know, talking about we're frustrated, but we also know we got to put on programming and other things because students are relying on the few of us who are left, uh, depending on how your situation. And it's been, you know, of course, different extremes at different places. But that has made me curious more than ever about potentially leaving the field. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. I see you. Thanks. So I think for me, I've said other also because I feel like during the pandemic, I'm not, I already knew this, but I think I it re-emphasized for me the important role that student affairs plays, especially during a crisis um, in the work that we do and the support that we offer students and representing in particular the student voice around how things, you know, having been able and I'm in a position as a um, AVP that, you know, often we are representing like, here's what students are thinking about it, or here's the feedback that we're getting on this stuff. So to me, I feel like it reinforced um, I think my purpose and my role and my passion around it, and I know it, it was super tiring too, um, but I also think it, it helps emphasize the important work that we do and the necessity that of having these roles on campus and the support. Yeah, thank you. A mentor told me once to be the, be the VP you've always needed, right? In you, at any level of your organization, how you choose to lead, right? When the world needs us, but we also need ourselves and our families need us. You only have hundred percent to give, right? So we often hear that. Um, how do we lead with love or lead with integrity? Carter, I, I also shout out, I love the love in the chat for structure. And then Jessica, I see your comment too. And I, I wrote it down right away because what you're naming here in the, um, I don't think I would have left my previous role without an external push, despite the burnout I was experiencing. I think that there's a moment of dissonance here of, am I able to name it? when it stings, right? I'm experiencing burnout. What will actually help me overcome or get through that? Um, which is we often tell students about resilience and how they build up, but as staff, we're tired as well. And so I really appreciate that noticing. Let's move on to the next slide, Kristen. Keep the conversation going. I'm just so grateful for folks that are contributing. And even if you're reflecting, that's contributions. Please hear that from me. Um, the next set of slides is meant to help us think about some reflective prompts. So when we explore our persistence, what are we talking about, right? Again, your choice to stay in some sort of role. So you might jot down, okay, here's my, my day job or my work environment. Here are the roles I play with my affinities or identities. Um, but one of the, some of this is from my dissertation research. One of the first questions was, what were you getting into? What? What were your expectations for the career you've chosen? Um, that might inform or influence how you choose to stay. You might aspire to a role. Uh, you might aspire to uh, the stepping stone. I know some of our students use that first major and first career move as a stepping stone, as a goal. Um, so before we even talk about why do you stay, it's what were your expectations upon entrance? That might help inform. Um, you may not be able to let go because you set out to chart this path for you and yourself. Um, so again, these next slides are, are simply questions for you. Kristen, I see your, your wheel spinning. And I think, yeah, yeah, this career expectations, I think it goes back to a little bit of what Carter was saying, right? I think we enter into this into the career field. I know I did when I entered into higher education. I thought this, I saw other professionals, right? I was a student and I saw professionals and I was trained in my graduate program to kind of see what was lying ahead. And then 
as the pandemic has unfolded, we didn't see any of that. And even if you were in graduate school at the time, like they, then you're seeing it happen in real time. But for many of us, we did not see that. And so now we're in roles where the career expectations and what's being asked of me is nowhere near what I thought I was getting myself into in that right. career. And I think it is a good question to think about as you think about you know, your purpose and meaningful work and, and just who you are as a person, you know, does that give you energy? Does that give you life or does that drain you? Right. And does that, and I think I've, I've experienced this myself over time and different, uh, different career opportunities and with friends as well of like, people will say, well, you're not the same person anymore. Like what has happened? And that I think is always for me, a sign of, oh gosh, sometimes I don't even realize that until someone else points it out for me. And sometimes it is because I've gotten into a place in my career where I, I this is not what I expected, right? And, and then you have to make the choice. Do I stay there or do I, do I not, right? Yeah. And I think that is so personal for each of us, but. Yeah, it makes me think of when we introduced the concept of career with young people. And we, in, in my experience growing up in public schools, we had career aptitude and career readiness tests Right. And exploratory tests. I remember these. Yeah. Right. We had them as well. Rarely did they talk about identity. No. And right. rare, if ever. And context. Right. Like it was more what will you do? Like the what and how will you do it? Not why you'll choose to do it and why you'll choose to stay in it and what might be unsafe for you to pursue. Right. Or how it right. might change. Right. I was going to say, or how you would be seen in that career. Right. Like I never in that test, I wish I remembered what mine said in high school. I remember taking it. I don't remember what it told me I was going to do, but it also didn't tell me how I would be seen or perceived or treated right. in, in those roles. Right. And once you want to be an astronaut, what would, what would keep you an astronaut? Right. Like as a young person dreaming, right. you think about the innocence culture of young people wanting to do something sometimes in public service and we don't often set them up for success. Right. So those are the first two. The next two questions expand the conversation a bit. If you've considered, some of you mentioned you've thought about it, you're curious. Have you considered leaving the field, whatever field you're entering today from? What made you return if you have or would stay? And if you have not, what would make you want to stay even more? And I think, Carter, this is where I also heard you talk about there are sometimes the perks. When someone says that you mattered to them and you helped them achieve, that's the helping profession in higher ed or nursing. Um, there's the sub question though, of if you were not in blank student affairs, if you were not in advertising, whatever that is for you, what would you be doing? And not to make you defensive, but why aren't you doing that? Right? Like when I did my dissertation research, I asked this very question and some folks said, I want, it was dreaming. I would be on Broadway. I would have a talk show. I would be a lawyer. And then they kind of laughed at the like, well, why aren't you pursuing that? And it's like, I can't now. Maybe I'm committed and entrenched in my career or my values don't align with that anymore, or I've just, I've come too far to turn back. Um, but it's interesting when we still ask us as the educators and the older adults in the room, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like that's a new question through the pandemic that's taught us to reflect in sweatpants, right? Like what am I doing and what do I want to get paid for? Are there reactions? Yeah, radio talk, amazing. Carter, you should have a radio talk show. I would listen. I would Thank absolutely you. listen to your radio talk show. A lot of folks, uh, a colleague and I were just chatting yesterday. A lot of folks make podcasts now. That's like the new trend uh, to share with the world some info. And, yeah. and, and please hear me. This is general. Some folks do the pivot. Uh, we know that folks choose to change careers and graduate when they're 80 years old, right? There's there's no wrong answer in today's conversation. We're just exploring our persistence of why we're choosing to engage in this reflection. Carter, I see your hand. Yeah, it's it's funny um, because I've always said I would love to do like a radio talk show, but it's kind of when you're in college, who does that? You know, you know a few people, there are a few local stations, you know, and it's, I mean, I'm a college grad, early 2000s. And so you didn't have the advent of podcast and as much media as we have today. Uh, but it's like, well, I got to actually have a job and like be employed and like not live on my parents' couch. And it's like, how do you get into that? Uh, but now you see the advent of technology and other things. And it's like, wow, I could do that. Uh, and, and in joking, a couple friends and I, we did it for like a year or two. Um, I mean, and this was like seven or eight years ago. And so media has even exploded since then. And we talk about doing it again. Uh, but then that other piece comes in. 
I still got to provide and do some other things. And so when you think about why aren't you pursuing that, it's I think it's that fear of the unknown. And there are some folks who jump in there two feet in and they go do it and much respect to them. And then there are those who would have done that 20 years ago, but now you're like, can I do that now? Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's a mixture of people. So that's, you know, when I think about that and I laugh and I joke as my office phone rings uh, and I laugh and I joke about things like that because that's what I would do. And I now find myself encouraging people that I interact, go do that thing before Mm -hmm. you get entrenched. Well, answer that phone call. That's opportunity calling for play. <laughs> Carter's like, I'm up. He's like, now yeah. I have to answer the phone for real. <laughs> it's just, and like Kelly and wedding planning. And yes, we ask students to dream and think about what they want to do in the world and how they want to contribute and might get paid for it. And I wonder if we were to sit with ourselves and ask the very questions, no matter our age. And Gladys, yeah. you mentioned just make a good point in the chat that changing your profession profession also means starting from the beginning. And that I knew for if I think about it for myself, that is so scary and uncertain that there then comes in some layers of my own identity of could I start from the beginning in my mid 40s? Like, what is that? Like, what does that look like? Like, I've invested a lot of time in 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 this into my career path so far. And some of that is just in my own head, right? That that you know that takes the self reflection and the um, ability to to do that work to to enter into that space. That's right. I think you're giving societal context. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I've I've seen in the chat a couple of side we call them side hustles, right? Like some folks that have like a, a full time role, and then maybe there's this passion project or this making ends meet and supporting other venues and hobbies that you might get, you should be paid for labor. Let's start there. And I've seen that this has been a pandemic function that folks have explored that they might do something and get paid for on the side as well. And I wonder where those, when we talk about purpose adjacent, where those might be intersecting, what buckets are you filling by, you know, creating moments for, for space and reflection? The next two questions are experiential, right? So experiences and identities. Well, what experiences have influenced you over time? That might be, Carter mentioned, getting that note from a student that said, you're the reason, right? Is that an experience or or you had this moment with professional folks at a conference or you are engaged with leadership, right? And there's these things that's like, I can't, I can't imagine a world without that, right? So what experiences, it could be supervisors, supervisees, um, and identity always matters. So how your identities influence your persistence, we touched on this a bit at the top, but family and community commitments also impact uprooting and reimagining, like the net will be there when you jump and take the leap of faith, but there are also things that tie us down and hold us back that we choose to engage in, and those are not negative. Um, Jennifer, I invite you in. Thank you. So I'm a little bit later in my career than most of you, and Yet I would say the experience that has influenced my career most recently has been um, being supported by my university to attend Georgetown's Institute of Transformational Leadership and pursue uh, the, uh, the leadership coaching certification and have really considered whether I want to go out on my own full time as a leadership coach. Um, but like like Carter was saying, those, those values, right, there, there are always competing values and the values of stability, uh, you know, and as I, my identity as a single person, I have no safety net of health care benefits, right? I need to provide for myself. And so staying within a, a traditional uh, eight to five university job just makes more sense. Um, But what I have been able to do now is to carve out a role that is basically running a leadership coaching practice within the university. And what the pandemic has has done for me is really bring to awareness the importance of being closer to family. And so I am in the process of negotiating that this role be done remotely so that I I can get there. And so you know, 
my most of my career has been in career services. And now, you know, probably three years before retirement, I'm making a switch into leadership coaching. So there is you can always make a change. That's awesome. And I would applaud you for putting the skills right like you these skills that were external, you're bringing them into your fold of your day job. And you're talking about how to like, just infuse it. That's like emotional intelligence, right? Like you're in tune with what you want to do. You're going to try to make it work with where you are. And you've named the conditions by which you probably need to stay in what way, right? Like, right. Right. And I mean, look, the reality is I have a lot of political clout having been there for many years. So you can't do, you can't, you can't pull those levers uh, three years into a career, but when you have them, when you have those levers, you really can pull them to create the kind of job that really is in alignment with your values and your skills. Uh, and to put that out there as an offering and see if there's somebody interested. And in this case, there was. Yeah, I appreciate the sense of reflection as well. When you know that we've heard and read about the great resignation and the great reevaluation of like, what will you regret if you take the leap, right? And the negative side of this, or the not so great side, is we are still asked and tasked to be doing a lot of things for a lot of people in the world of higher ed. We are short staffed, underpaid, tired, right? There are moments where you wake up and you're like, I don't know why I do this work because I don't always have that meaning and purpose moment in every meeting I'm in on Zoom, right? So there's this reality check. Um, and it's, I've seen a lot of folks depart, right? And there was research before this pandemic that said that 50% of us were leaving in the first five years. That's a problem because this is a, a game-changing profession, in my opinion. Um, and so that's, I think, this call to action on it's not good or bad if you choose to stay, right? We're just trying to create moments to reflect. Thank you, Jennifer, for sharing. The next slide, Kristen, if you will, is our last two questions, are our last two questions. Reflecting, and I say physical because remember physical offices, reflecting on any sort of digital, physical, whatever your office space or your work environment might be, describe an item that reminds you why. And I don't intend to be the Pollyanna in the room on like, stay in the profession. It's your, this is all positivity. I'm trying to create space for the realities that are up against our purpose and our sense of purpose. But there might be something in physical realm or your Rolodex in your mental capacity of an item or something that reminds you of the why. And I invite folks to drop in chat or share, raise hand, or just unmute if you want. Sometimes those are related to any emotional investments. Maybe it's also motivation, which could be internal, external. Any factors of reward, right? Are there awards on your bookshelves? Are there photos of students or quotes? Sometimes there's the happy folder, right? The rainy day, like, oh, my mailbox from this student retreat fills my bucket. But I don't look at that when I have hard meetings, right? You go home with a, a full inbox and a tired back and you realize, oh, do I need to actually pull out that photo and remind myself why? I want folks to continue populating. I love this. Yeah, I love seeing it. I love seeing it. The trend I'm seeing is it's usually about someone else and the impact you're making on someone else or society at large, right? Photos of others, thank you cards from others. So there's that compassion fatigue trap, right? In a good way. We are doing meaningful work with and for other people. And when you put your mask on first, or this is the mirror, right? Am I reflecting on my own purpose? Who is writing, who would you write the card to, right? That helps you look in the mirror. Lots of smiles, photos. Thanks, Kelly, for that. That you're part of a bigger and beautiful world that sometimes the mundane stuff is just draining. It's perspective. Yeah, and I think no matter your career, right? I said it earlier, it's, it's called work. It's called work for a reason. Some of us want to not make it feel like work or you love where you work or how you work, but they might you might have dissonance, right, in your passion and purpose and what you're paid to do. Awesome. I love. It. I hope everyone takes those out, those files out, and the, like stops and looks at those pictures too. I think yeah. so often I look around my own office space and I think 
yeah, I see these pictures every day, but I forget why I put them there to begin with, right? And they just become so much part of everything that I see, I don't notice them, right? And I don't actually stop and think and look at the faces in the pictures and say, oh, this is the why, right? This is this is why I do this. And you know, for me, it's always been pictures of my children um, mm. or at least in the last eight years, I keep them in every office I've, I've had. And I've had in a couple offices in the last eight years here at Leadership. So, um, but I always have their picture with me and not just because I think they're cute and adorable, I, I do, but I do this work because I want the world they live in to be better than the world that they were born into. And I know that the people that I work with get to do that. Right. And so, but I don't always stop and think about that. Right. And I think that's the, the part that gets lost sometimes in that. Yeah. And I, thank you, Chris. And I, their kids are cute. Um, and I also, I wrote down validation um, as a thought, right. That often it can be attributed to a negative energy or a negative space. And it doesn't have to be you know, seeking validation is okay. That's very human and natural. Um, finding it from within is the, is the process we're seeking, right? Is that, do we need to have that external reward or motivation to persist? It, it's nice and it certainly helps create parameters, but wouldn't it be also awesome if our society didn't operate in the space of deficiency and validation seeking? Because you matter and the work, the work you do in any realm matters to someone else. And so I, I really wrestle with sometimes like, am I enough? Like, am I trying to enable students to do something else? Or like, what am, what's my sense of purpose? Kathy? Brent, I, I so agree with what you're saying in that I'm not a person who goes out and seeks validation for what I do. But when I think about some of the things in my office and some of the things that are most meaningful, I think sometimes it's when you've been recognized for doing that good work. Um, and I'm a person, like, I feel like I'm a, a servant leader you know, and I'm, you know, part of that, I think, is what has kept me in this field when things get challenging. But I also think it's super important. And I try to think about this with my staff is also giving them validation for the work that they're doing, because it's so often that we get the you're not doing this right, or here's all the things that I don't like about what you did or what you said, kind of email. So to have reinforcement of the positive things in the good work people is doing is, I mean, it's good for me, but it's also I know good for for my staff and my team that I work with. And so for me, that's one of the things that's really important is to make sure that we do that. But I also think that one of the things is I'm looking around my office here, one of the things that I have also on my desk is a picture of um, when I defended my dissertation uh, from that. So I think about kind of that type. I mean, for me, that is super meaningful because it's a culmination of kind of work and career um, and, and a huge accomplishment. So I think also things like that that have helped to motivate you to kind of stay on the path um, for me is really meaningful as well when I think about it. Yeah, thank you for that. When I did my dissertation research, some folks reflected on the diplomas that they have in their office, um, not as accomplishment and pride of achievement culture, but showing that they could do it, mm -hmm. whether it's first gen or person of color, like how also students see themselves as I look at mine, we're like what that actually means that you persisted in some way and how might you enable others to do the same, not to show off. Yes, and navigated so much in the past 10 years specifically. Our, our next poll, I think, Kristen, is an open end or a, a poll I'll use lightly. Um, responding in the chat is with all of those questions that we've explored with not enough time to really sit with self. Um, and again, you'll have access to this post. But as I reflect on my own persistence in this very moment, why do I choose to stay? I invite folks to offer words, phrases, quotes in any realm. There's no wrong answer. But why are you, why are you today? Why do you choose to stay? I like all these. I appreciate you all sharing them. Mm. Yeah, the work is not yet done. This is so awesome and rich. Look at this chat, everybody.
Oh, I love that. The build a life outside of work, right? This myth of work and life balance when we're, we're more one whole person. It's fascinating. I want to share just a, a quick pulse check because this is still in line with the research that I did a couple of years ago um, where I pulled out some themes. And I think as you all are looking in the chat, you were in conversation together with our words, right? That there's something calling us to do this good work. Some of the themes I had found, Kristen, if you want to look at the next slide, <clears throat> were that folks were speaking to how they've invested deeply in their vocation, right? In whatever their calling was, I've come so far or I've invested because it matters, right? There's someone else that I'm impacting. The second large theme that I had found, and I wonder if this is still true to you all, is that you're not alone. That in the profession you're a part of or the community you work with, whether it's with coworkers or family members or students, um, colleagues that were in community. We talked yesterday in Compassion Fatigue about the frontline workers during the COVID pandemic, trying when it first started, like how they were in community, navigating the unknown, um, and why we choose to go to professional conferences, why we choose to, you know, come to work every day is that there's someone else around us that might be navigating this, but it's, you're not alone. And the last, the deeper theme that I found was that there's this advocacy toward an equitable world, that it matters, the work is yet to be done, that not the trap of if not me, then who, and I loved Carter, how you wrote, like, it's better with me in it than not, um, but that there's work to do and that we are planting seeds of justice. There's this, I have this calling and purpose that I have a chance, exactly this, Zach, thank you. Small acts when multiplied can transform the world, right? It's that one moment of ripple effect. One student you impact or one colleague at the water cooler that you enable might save someone's mental health, right? But that's not because you're the martyr. It's just being in community to advocate for someone else and for the world we wanna live in. And we do this often with students. So that's, again, like the trap. I want us to sit with our own mirror, right? As the older student, the teacher-learner dichotomy, like how do I sit with self and reflect on my own purpose and belonging? Here are some, in other words, Kristen, if you want to share a little bit, um, the why. You've seen TED Talks, you've read books, you've heard about the why. It's not what you do and how you do it, it's why, um, and which in, in essence is your impact and those around you and how they impact you. This long-term investment, maybe that satisfaction or expertise, I'm good at it, I like getting paid for it, it's motivating validation, awesome. Um, you're not alone, you're connected, you're needed, it's purposeful with a special common bond. I made some uh, like nuanced connections with like student affairs professionals and firefighters, right? Like you could work at any institution across the world and you kind of understand what someone does. Uh, when students see a sweatshirt across the world and they kind of see a values congruence or an alignment. There's something that connects us, even if we've never worked together. And then there's this pursuit of equity that it actually all matters because we're creating moments to change the world, right? As, as small. And again, as Pollyanna as that sounds, what would the world look like if you weren't doing what you were doing? I think maybe that's the negative reflection is that you do matter and you are enough and you're contributing. What are some more reactions for folks as you think about all of this contextual conversation of persistence, you're exploring it, you're curious about other opportunities. What are some more, I will invite more dialogue in this chat. I have a, a thought. I think in changing professions, it's also, you know, I've worked with students for a really long time. And so it's, will I get that same fulfillment? You know, I know I can do the job, but will I get that same fulfillment and the impact that I made um, in being able to help a student. I know um, one of the reasons like I work with students is because I wanna be that guide, mentor, advisor that I didn't quite have when I was younger. And so I try to give them the resources and the help and the support, even the acknowledgement. Like as an advisor, like one of my goals is before we even get started with anything, it's how are you doing? And then how are you doing as a student? And then how are you doing in your leadership role? because students aren't just one thing. And that's just kind of like my foundation of how I advise students. Um, and so, yeah, it's just kind of like some thoughts that I had, but I really appreciate the conversation and it, it really all hit, like you guys did such a, a, a great job in like the conversations and just, I appreciate everybody else's response and that it's refreshing to have that like, yeah, I can relate to that. And yeah, that makes sense. I, I felt that too. So I appreciate that. 
Thank you for sharing that. I really love your advising and mentorship style, asking people who, who they are and how they are first before you get to task. When you start with who they are, it informs the tasks that they're working and operating from, right? And we're whole people. So if we started with the why and how and with care, we might have better results if that's what our organizations are asking us to achieve. I also wonder, just uh, this conversation is making me think a little bit more about like when we're encouraging people to go into the field um, and often mentoring people, if, if this needs to be part of the conversation of the why, and also maybe, and I've seen this on some of the social media stuff around, around the resi great resignation stuff from student affairs is, do we talk about the hard parts of the job and make sure that people have a realistic understanding of what it means um, to go into it. But then I also think about then, is this also being incorporated in our graduate preparation programs as part of the kind of finding your why and how it really has to be some of that intrinsic motivation um, because you're not paid well in this field and because you will work long hours and all of those kinds of things that people have a good understanding of that. Because I feel like I see on the other end, maybe people coming out not having um, is realistic of expectations about what that work is going to look like and especially when it gets hard not realizing that 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 was going to be part of it or to the extent that it was going to be and i know COVID threw that all for a loop um in particular but i still think before that it was i was kind of seeing it as well yeah some of the conversation i've read um is what someone called gaslighting the mission uh like you knew what you were getting into or you chose this um and i agreed kathy to in graduate prep and in the onboarding and mentoring process, like what are we, who are we attracting and do they know the grass is green fear? Um, but I think it's also navigating that reality in any vocation is how do we help students think about, and Kristen and I were talking about this before you all joined, when we enable them, go do an entrepreneur, be a TikTok sensation, like what are you gonna do when that goes away? Like how do you navigate resilience through a vocation? Um, we enable and empower folks to go do that thing but we may not be setting them up for success on reflecting on staying in that thing, right? Or um, you will hit compassion fatigue. So couldn't it be true that this is actually preventative work, right? By centering your purpose, that it will happen when it hits you, but you have this internal safety net beyond the photos in the file, right? When, how do you navigate? That's resilience if we're setting you up for success. But I think you're exactly right. We have not named you know, all of the unknowns, and that's enabling our newer and older staff to still create boundaries, to rely on each other, to call for help, because we know that this frustration and fatigue and stress is ever present. So it's navigating it, because when more people bail, we lose our own sense of community for those of us who have chosen to stay, right? And then we start to flirt even more with doubt of like, should I go too? Well, I think it goes back to your research, Brent. One of the very first pieces that you mentioned was community. And when that community goes away, and we know COVID has already changed the way our communities are shaped, regardless yeah. of where we're working. But then when the people then are not the same or the feeling of community is not the same, I think it is very easy to question, why, why do I, why should just go? Like, because there is a, I am hiding behind a screen. I am working from home. Maybe I'm not needed as much as I thought I was needed. And so I think that is a really, um, an interesting and needed conversation to be having with our staffs currently and as we're bringing people on and, and Gladys you mentioned transparency I think that has to be even in our interview process I know many of you are interviewing people to take on new roles and how are we transparent and honest with people as they're coming in so that they that they are signing up for what they know right that they don't get there and they're like well this is not at all what I thought it was going to be right. and I think oftentimes our hiring practices are, we'll just leave that to the side and you'll figure that out when you get there. And that I don't think served us well. I don't, no. and it didn't serve us well before and it does not serve us well now. It's such a disservice. And I was just gonna say that exact thing that we were not doing this in a great way before the pandemic started. Right. And so now we have this new factor that tells us, hold on, things could look different. Jennifer talked about advocating to work remotely, right? Like we can make sense of our own way of knowing now because the world has forced us to do so. Right. Um, and Kristen, if you will, for that last slide as folks in our final reflections, I put that image back up, the purpose at the small and, and the, the adjacent, but there's this quote out there though, 
that you might fall in love with it, but passion doesn't pay the bills. There's this reality, this wall that we might hit where you might mean well and. And so this is not meant to leave us on the like reality, bust the bubble, but I think it's important to just name it, right? That and the world is still operating this machine and system, right? Often supremacy culture, oppression culture. Um, how do we survive and thrive through that? Um, you can find my dissertation research online. I can also, I'm happy to drop uh, my email here in chat and folks can and certainly find that. Um, I want that to be accessible to you all if you're interested. Thank you for the question, Emily. I'm happy to connect with you all. Um, final reflections from folks in the chat or you're, well, you're welcome to unmute as well. I just am so grateful for us to be in community together. Many of you I do not know. Um, just thank you for your contributions to this. And in whatever ways you're curious, I hope you stay curious if you don't choose to stay in your profession. Brent, these are really awesome slides that I think many of us could use in different settings. Are you comfortable sharing them for that purpose? Yeah, I certainly am. Thank you for that. I just wanted to say I appreciate um, everyone here, especially Kristen and Brett, um, for you know, leading the conversations and everybody for their input and their experiences. And like I, I mentioned before, it's definitely refreshing to know like you're not the only one because I feel like now, at least me personally, like through the pandemic, you know, now we have colleagues and myself included who are like, basically like the students where they're trying to figure out, but so are we, because now we're like, we can do more, you know, as mentioned, now we can work from home and still have that impact and still do our work. And just so many things have influenced, you know, within the last two years, kind of um, our goals, changing careers, our passion. So I just wanted to say, I really appreciated this. I didn't really know what to expect from it. This is the first time I'm attending a uh, leadership. And so I really enjoyed it and I appreciate everyone. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, with that, it is almost one, it's almost been an hour. The time went so quickly, Brent, mm -hmm. and I, and I as well, I just appreciate your wisdom and just the make the meaning making that you have of not only your research, but just your lived experience as well and the care that you have for this field and the professionals that, that work in it. So thank you on behalf of leadership and everybody here is just a joy uh, as always to spend time with you and to share you with others. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, if you do wanna know more about leadership, if this is new to you, here's our website, come check us out. Uh, we'll be back here tomorrow at noon again. Um, and we're gonna be talking with Dr. Willie Banks and we're gonna have some reflections from the top, uh, looking at leadership development development from the lens of a vice president for student affairs. Um, and so I'm eager to join that conversation. We'll be here the same time, same channel, um, different Zoom link though. So if you need that, check out our social media and you can, you can get that. Um, you know, also just thinking about ways to support leadership if it, you know, if this is something that you are interested in not only learning more about, but also supporting just a reminder that we are a not-for-profit. And if you, if you want to donate, Financially, you are welcome to do that at that link here. Um, otherwise, I will stop our screen share and just thank you all again for, for joining us today. I hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday afternoon.